Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Archaeology Month presentation. My name is Linda Furterer, and I am president of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society. I'd like to start out by saying that normally the presentation of the Chester Price Award would be the centerpiece of our spring meeting. But today, since we're not having an in-person meeting, for reasons that we're all well aware of, uh, it will be the centerpiece of today's presentation. So here we go. The New Hampshire Archaeological Society is pleased to prevent Victoria Vicky Bunker with the Chester B. Price Award, the society's highest honor for more than three decades of research fieldwork and teaching archaeology in the Granite State. Just to give the audience a little background on Vicki, she was born and bred in New Hampshire, attended the University of New Hampshire before earning her master's from Tufts University and her PhD from Boston University. Early in her career, she was instrumental in building a strong foundation for the state conservation and rescue archaeology program, affectionately known as SCRAP. Vicki founded Victoria Bunker Inc. in 1981, a cultural resource management firm for which she serves as owner and principal archaeologist. Throughout her career, she has authored more than 500 archaeological reports and articles representing all levels of survey throughout the state. <clears throat> in addition, Vicki has contributed tremendously to our understanding of New Hampshire Native American ceramics. Through her extensive work at Garvin Falls and the other Merrimack River sites, Vicki demonstrated it is possible to make social and cultural inferences based on elements of style. As the daughter of a World War II Air Army Forces officer, she brought a sense of heritage, connection, and compassion to her research and documentation of the 1942 B-18A bomber site crash in Lincoln. It is evident that archaeology has benefited tremendously from Vicki's research, passion, mentoring, and enduring friendship she has made in the course of her career. So Vicki, I would like to... Black. <laughs> I would like to present you with this Chester Price Award plaque and a gift certificate for $50 to the Apple Tree Nursery in Winnescombe, New Hampshire, and convey that the board of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society looks forward to many more years of your creative contributions to the historic and archaeological heritage of the, of the Granite State. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, um, before I uh, turn the presentation over to Dick Bovert, who will be our host for the presentation, I'd like to thank Dave Truby for his eloquent newsletter article in the NHAS Fall 2020 issue outlining Vicki's history and contribution to archaeology in the state, and to uh, Mark Greenlee for his work on the design, wording, completion of the plaque. So... Dick, without further ado, I pass the presentation on to you. Congratulations, Vicki. Thanks again to you and all. Thank you. Welcome, Vicki, and well, good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to the New Hampshire Archaeological Society 2022 Archaeology Month presentations. My name is Dick Bovere, Secretary of the NHAS. In this series, we feature topics from New Hampshire archeology span and from around the country, presented by scholars who all have a connection to the Granite State and none more so than Vicki Bunker. We invite everyone to view our complete presentation uh, schedule at nhas.org and on our Facebook and Instagram pages. This event will be recorded and posted on our YouTube account. If viewers do not wish to be recorded, be sure their camera is off. Tech support for viewers of this presentation is available in the chat or at webmaster at nhas.org. Today, we're very excited to welcome Vicki Bunker, who will speak on her work at the Wakefield Rail Yard. We invite viewers to submit questions via the chat function located to the right on the Zoom screen, at least my Zoom screen. Following the presentation, I will gather questions from the chat responses and pose them to the presenter. We will try to get as many questions as we can, understanding that we might not be able to get to all, of the, all of the questions. So without further ado, we welcome Vicki Bunker and thank you all for joining us. It's all yours, Vic. Great, good afternoon, thank you. Now, 
Can everybody see me? Yes, good. And my assistant? And let's hope that you don't assume the same position during this presentation. She's uh, sound asleep. <laughs> Well, thank you for inviting me. And again, thank you for the award. I'm grateful and um, it means a lot to me. And now I will turn to a PowerPoint presentation that was destined to happen two years ago and has been canceled twice, but fortunately here we are today. I would like to present the results of an archeological survey in San Bernville, New Hampshire, one of the villages in the town of Wakefield regarding Turntable Park and the um, archeological resources there. Now, some of you may remember that, dare I say, 11 years ago, I went to Wakefield to do a regional survey, a town-wide survey for the um, Wakefield Heritage Commission, joined by Dave Truby, and Sheila Charles and Dennis Howe. And we recorded some 20 industrial sites on the waterways in town. Well, this time I jumped at the chance when the town of Wakefield contacted me regarding an archeological survey of a railroad feature in their town park. Wakefield is an amazing historic minded community. They practice preservation actively. The Heritage Commission is fantastic. They love archeological sites, standing buildings, railroads, and pretty much everything in between. There are museums in the town. There's restoration projects going on all the time. Um, one feather in their cap is the Newichawana Canal, which is um, on the National Register and occupies an unusual position in that two states Maine and New Hampshire came together to support the nomination. So Wakefield's not afraid to tackle the tough stuff and does an excellent job. This time, the focus of the survey was in the village of San Bernville, one of the many smaller um, centers within the larger town. And if you can see the little red dot, that's right um, on the main street in the center of San Bernville which is the location of Turntable Park. Turntable Park uh, is so named for a railroad turntable, which is sort of the, shall I say, the hub of the park. It's the most visible feature and it's the one that's best known. People come to look at it, picnic and enjoy it, um, but nobody has ever before attempted to understand what other kinds of archeological resources might be present in the park. Excuse me, got rid of the cat. Um, the Wakefield Heritage, Heritage Commission advanced the project and contacted me to do a phase one archeological survey in Turntable Park. The survey involved historic research, archeological field documentation, and indeed, old dogs can do new tricks, ground penetrating radar survey. The property is very interesting. It's about two acres in size. It is owned by the state of New Hampshire, but leased by the town of Wakefield for use as a park. The survey was spearheaded by the Wakefield Heritage Commission, and they had been awarded a grant from the Certified Local Government Program under the umbrella of New Hampshire Division of Historic Resources. So a lot of um, parts and pieces to the organization of the project. What I'd like to do first is to show you some images that reflect our research efforts involving numerous people and numerous places. These folks were the most well-informed local historians and active in the community. On the right-hand side is Pamela Wigan, the chair of the Wakefield Heritage Commission. She knows everything. She just knows everything and is an advocate for historic resources through her beloved town. On the left is Rick Poole, who is a, also a local historian and a restoration expert of buildings, a building restoration expert and in the middle is Rick Libby, um, a historian from Wolfboro, 
and involved in the Wolfboro Railroad history. These two gentlemen, Rich and Bill, were also amazing historians. They have created a model Boston and Maine Railroad in the building that you see on the, on the left, which is part of the Heritage Park Railroad Museum. They've put in every detail as they have done piles of research to recreate how the town would have looked circa 1909 when the railroad was in full swing. They have houses, they have streams, they have mountains, trees, little dogs um, in the backyard, laundry on the clothesline of the neighboring houses, and you can go there. Well, I don't know if they're open right now, but you can go to this museum and observe their work and the train as it goes around the tracks in and out of the exhibit. It's great. The Heritage Park Railroad Museum has another component, and this is in the Union Depot building, which has now been listed to the National Register. See, Wakefield never quits. They keep going. It's fantastic historic preservation. The museum is important for its um, history, for its architecture, for its setting, and it also ho houses an extremely important um, archive with photos, maps, memorabilia, all things railroad. Also, if you get a chance to go to Wakefield, you would probably want to stop in there, see the exhibits and look at some of the historic pictures and so on that they have on display. Well, also as part of the research, we went a little further afield. Sheila Charles, who worked with me on the project, went south. She uh, went to Lowell, Massachusetts, to the Boston and Maine uh, Railroad Historical Society and came back with piles of information, uh, maps, documents, inventories, with extremely detailed um, notations on them that helped us interpret the rail yard and the turntable where we were working. I went north and I visited two existing standing roundhouses, one in North Conway and another one in Bartlett. Both of these provided me information on how a roundhouse works. With the turntable you can see in the foreground of North Conway and the doors leading to the um, engine repair bays. Uh, the scale of these things is enormous. And once you get inside these buildings, it's close quarters. The locomotives pull in and the workers go down into the pits below the tracks and do the repairs as necessary. So this one is Conway and this one is Bartlett. You'll see that these roundhouses aren't full circles. They are semicircular and uh, access is given to these by going across tracks that are rotated on a turntable in front of the building. You'll also note on this Bartlett example that the door, one of the doors is open. The doors on these roundhouse facilities opened in. Part of the reason for that was in wintertime, you wouldn't be able to open the doors out in snowy and icy conditions. So things are very practical, very well thought out and extremely functional when it comes to railroad buildings. The people that worked with me are near and dear to me. Dennis Howe, um, industrial sites archeologist, did all of the photography and the mapping for our project area. And this included the turntable pit that you see right behind Dennis and the remaining two acres of the project property. And Sheila Charles, who did um, documentary research, as I mentioned, and was in the field with me. And here she is recording the what's it. Don't put that in the questions, we don't know. But if you do know what it is, please let me know. And here we have uh, Joel and Kevin from Horizons Engineering, who conducted the ground penetrating radar study. A huge asset to the interpretations of the site. Now I'd like to give you a sense of the history to provide you a background context about the location. The Eastern Railroad was the first railroad that pushed its way north from the seacoast. And in 1854, Union 
and that's where the museum and the model railroad are both located, Union became the northernmost terminal of the Eastern Railroad. Union is located on the south side of the town of Wakefield. As time went on, um, Wolfboro Junction was created in the village of San Bernville. The blue circle just highlights our survey area. At Wolfboro Junction on the south side of Main Street were um, a large station, associated buildings, and on the north side of Main Street was the rail yard, the San Bernville yard. Now you'll notice that I said San Bernville yard and this is Wolfboro Junction. We'll get to that story in a little bit. Uh, the map is from 1892, but the um, Wolfboro Junction was in fact uh, created in the eight, early 1870s. You'll also see that this map depicts a series of tracks tracks around the railroad station area on the south side of Main Street, a spur track that goes off to the right, which connected to an ice pond, and a network of tracks that continue north. The one that goes straight north goes to Conway, and the one that curves around to the left goes to Wolfboro. Things were really hopping in the 1870s in San Bernville. The bottom illustration shows the station and some of its um, associated buildings and Main Street, how Main Street looked in the day. On the right hand side is a store known as Garvin Store, the same store that you see in the upper left. And in the distance is Sanborn's Inn, which you see in the background of the bottom picture. Garvin Store is considered as National Register eligible to the um, San Bernville um, Historic Center, but it has not been listed to the National Register. What's interesting also is that the, San, um, the Garvin store was more than just a shop, more than just a storefront where you could get everyday goods, but in the back you'll see additional buildings. These buildings uh, stored such things as grain, supplies, anything that needed to be shipped by rail. And there was a workshop in the building where people sewed pants. They made pants of sailcloth or canvas, which were leftover scraps from sail making in the seacoast. So the trains brought the fabric to uh, Wakefield and they were remade into clothing and then shipped back to the seacoast. By the next decade, things changed again. By this time, the rail line is part of the Boston and Maine system. John Sanborn, pictured here, was appointed manager of the Boston and Maine in 1892 and excelled at his job. He was then promoted and he became the uh, director of the Boston and Maine Sanbornville Division headquarters. Um, Sanborn was a well-educated man. His family was involved in uh, various industries in town. He himself operated a grist mill and a sawmill. He had numerous political connections and he was a visionary. He envisioned what was then Wolfboro Junction to become Sanbornville and in 1895 the town was renamed in his honor. This is how the town looked. If you were standing up on High Street, which is sort of northeast of the rail yard, you would look down the street and see the new town hall. You'd see the back of the Garvin store and in the distance, you'd see the station. In 1903, when the station had new functions, it was enlarged. A story was put on the top of it to house offices. As a district headquarters, it was a very important building and needed to not only serve as a terminal and passenger, but um, as administrative as well. And in the picture on the right, you can see the town hall in the background on the right-hand side of the picture. And on the left, you can catch a glimpse of the roundhouse in the distance and the multiple tracks that crossed Main Street and entered the Sanbornville yard. These kind of pictures 
I spent hours poring over these pictures looking for clues. I mean, it was real detective work to try to look at the configuration of tracks, to try to look at where the buildings were and how they interrelated. And it's really fun, fun to do. This map or plan, I guess I should say, is um, a 1909 depiction of the San Bernardino yard. This was our Rosetta Stone for the survey. We had other sources like the pictures and additional maps, but this one guided us as we were in the field. Um, all of our efforts had this sort of interesting circular um, situation to them. We'd go in the field, find something, circle back to a map, not find it, circle over to a photo, call up Pamela Wigan and ask. And as a result, we pieced together the situation addressing all of the components that you see on the 1909 map. A rail yard, just to give you a little feel for what a rail yard does, it's a location of constant activity. Trains are coming and going and at a division headquarters such as San Bernville, diverse activities are, are all working in this rather small space um, in an interrelated fashion. So the trains will come in, some trains will continue north, which is to the right in this depiction, and they'll either go straight to Conway or spin off and go to Wolfboro. Other trains come in for repairs and they would go to the turntable and directed to the right place, a, a repair house, a machine shop, the roundhouse, or storage. Busy, noisy, dirty, bustling. And at this time, one of the main employers of the, the village of San Bernville, the town of Wakefield really, as a whole, um, not only employing people in the yard, but across the street at the station in baggage, in the restaurant, in um, administration. Um, this was a big deal. This was a really big deal. This was the division headquarters of a major line that went from Portsmouth up through Dover, continued north to Conway and Bartlett in the White Mountains. 1911, the railroad was destroyed due to fire. Um, a fire broke out in April actually and burned it except for a tiny portion of the roundhouse to the ground, nothing was left. In the 1920s, this um, Sanborn insurance company map shows what remained as, as the location entered the 20th century. Only three bays remain standing of the um, roundhouse. The turntable remained in place, but that was underground, not a standing building. And you'll see other features on this map, um, the store on one side of the street, the hotel on the other, and down towards the bottom of this image, the station on the south side of Main Street. Also, if you look real close, it says Sanbornville, New York. So much fun to find a typo on a Sanbornville map. Anyway, 1958, what was left of the station was demolished, gone. And as we entered the later years of 1900s, in the 1970s, the Wolfboro Railroad was um, in operation as a tourist line. People went back and forth to San Bernville and Wolfboro for recreation. And um, railroad historians made displays in the park and brought in boxcars and other things for people to look at and enjoy. In 1992, the park was renovated. Now, when an archeologist hears the word renovation, we all kind of cringe and wonder, well, how much was there and how much is left? And that's exactly what we set out to determine. What was there and what could be left archeologically speaking? What I'd like to do now is turn to the results of the survey. Um, I've called it then and now because what I'd like to do is show you how it was before the fire and how it is now, and then uh, highlight some of the archeological features um, within the park property. We looked at the whole park property 
to give the historic commission a sense of what type of archeological resources could they expect should any plans come forward for modifications. They'd then be well informed. Um, they had hoped at the time to put in a new visitor's building that did not materialize, but they still have the archeological results to help guide them in the future. So to give you yet another view, because as we get into the park, you'll find that it gets a little jumbled. Main Street at the bottom, the station on the south side of the street. The yellow line outlines the limits of, our, of the park, of the rail yard, and of our study area, about two acres. The northern half is wooded, the southern half is cleared with a parking lot along Main Street, and the turntable, which I think you can see as the circle, kind of in the lower portion of the, of the outline. Outside this area, Garvin's store and the town hall off to the east. And you can still see remnants of tracks between uh, the active line and the, and the woods in the top half of this image. The line on the right-hand side of the yellow outline is an active track. And this track is the track which takes gravel from Ossipee to Boston every day. My attempt, don't look too closely, my attempt at superimposing some of the building locations to basically to help me not get lost. You know, two acres isn't that big, but it gets awfully big when you're walking around in circles. So here we see the approximate locations of the roundhouse and associated shops and way off in the, in the northern end the carpenter shop, the paint shop, and other um, ancillary buildings. So we're going to take a walk now. And we're going to start at Main Street with um, the red circle um, highlighting the location of the flagman's house. But at Main Street, we'll start there. And then we're going to walk north, which is again to the right on this map, across the street. Here's the station. The station was huge. Um, and it contained, as I said, offices on the top, a restaurant at the end, which was called the Armstrong Restaurant. And in one seating, they could serve 145 people. You can see the number of people gathered here waiting for trains. You can um, imagine this as a vibrant hub. It was the latest style of architecture. It um, served communities north and south and employed so many people and provided such a center and focus for the town of San Bernville at that time. That's what it looks like today. Across the street is the location of the flagman's house, which marks the entrance to the rail yard. And here is Ivory Rice, who was the flagman. You can see that he has his flag in his hand, he's got his watch on his chain, and he's standing in front of the flagman's house. This is part of the Boston and Maine um, development and ownership of the rail yard. And the house was built to total specifications. It was one story, it was square, and important for archeologists, it was built on granite piers. There's no foundation. Inside his shop, we found an, Sheila Charles found an inventory of the interior shop um, contents. And he had his desk, he had his bookshelves, he had his rocking chair, he has his lantern. This picture also gives us our first real glimpse into the rail yard. We can see the switching mechanisms, we see the tracks. We see spurs that go off into the roundhouse and we see the water tower. We see an engine that is parked just off the turntable. And in the background, we see the gable ends of the supervisor's office building and two of the work shed buildings. Again, in the background of this picture, you can see more hints. You can see again, the um, water tower and the roundhouse. And you can see Ivory Rice himself off to the left-hand side of the picture in his garden. 
the garden must have been amazing. And I find this just such a personal image um, with his picket fence and his plantings. He made his job his own. As time went by, Ivory Rice and his um, flagman's building were gone. And in this image from the 1950s, you can see that locomotives were gone too, and were now, well, not locomotives, that steam powered locomotives were gone and now replaced by diesel. The man that you see standing in there just behind him is where Ivory Rice's flagman's house would have stood. The store is on the right hand side. The water tower associated with the store is in the background. Today, Ivory Rice flagman house would be under that green car. The switching mechanisms are contained in the metal box. The store is still standing and behind the store are the footings of the water tower, although the water tower is gone. That is the active track that goes to Ossipi. As we get into the yard, the first thing that any locomotive would have to do is to go to the ash pit. And you can see where that's located by the red circle between the entrance and the turntable. In the field, we documented a series of visible features that showed us the outline of the ash pit. This included these massive granite blocks and brick paving stone, um, brick pavers. Within the ash pit, hot ashes were dumped um, by locomotives as before they entered the yard for safety. The pit would have been lined with stone and or brick. It would have been about five feet across, about 15 feet long, and would have had an entrance on one side so that workers could go in, remove the ash for disposal. This was the first and foremost safety feature of um, entering the railroad, the work yard, I should say. Um, and we were able to confirm the existence of the subsurface components of the ash pit still intact. Now, don't you love it when everybody puts up these wiggly little pictures? Outside the yellow lines, you can see the um, ground penetrating radar results showing mixed conditions. Inside the yellow lines is a more homogeneous and different image, which reflects the presence of the ash pit. Now, we wouldn't normally call it that if we just had this cold, but with the ground surface information and the archival information, I'm confident that the results of the ground penetrating radar confirm that there is an underground component to what we saw on the surface. Aha, uh -huh. but there's always a surprise. Just between the ash pit and the fence line, um, where nothing was expected, something was identified. And that would be an underground storage tank, probably for diesel fuel, we just don't know. We never would have seen it on the ground surface. And fortunately, the ground penetrating radar provided um, something underground, the right size and shape for a storage tank. And you know, quite honestly, this is why um, as an archeologist, Doing surface survey in a rail yard is wonderful, but doing subsurface survey, caution, because you never know what kind of buried materials you might run into, such as an underground storage tank. Moving further into the rail yard, the next important place would have been the supervisor's office. This was the, the man that supervised the entire activities of the yard. It was his job to make everything run smoothly, all the coming and going. A train going through to Conway or returning, another train going through to Wolfboro or returning, other um, components coming in for repair, whether they be cars or locomotives. He had to make it all go smoothly. That's the office. And as you can see, it's perched right on the lip of the um, roundhouse of the turntable rather, the turntable pit. Um, and you see the roundhouse wall to the left and you see the back 
in the background the um, gable end of one of the um, shops. Also, you can see that that shop had railroad tracks running right straight through it, and the doors on that shop would have opened to permit the train to pull through. Today, this is what it looks like. It's been leveled, it's been graded, no trace, nothing showed up in ground penetrating radar, and nothing probably would have because like all of these small buildings, it would not have had a foundation. Now we can turn to, now that we know how we get in and out of the um, yard, we can turn to the main features, the roundhouse and the uh, turntable. There was a roundhouse built in the 1850s, um, turntable built in the 1850s, and it measured um, 50 feet across. It was expanded and now measures 60 feet across to accommodate larger locomotives. Here's the archeology span team, hard at work, and this is what they did. <laughs> in the left-hand side, the soil was removed by hand and put into a car. That car went out on the tracks and would have been dumped or, re or the material reused somewhere. You can see the sliding wooden boards held on the sides of the car to hold the gravel in. In the background, again, you see the roundhouse. And on the right-hand side is the um, roundhouse and turntable pit completed with the trestle going across it. You see locomotives backed in, not pulled in straight. The doors are open, they're swinging in. There's ventilation louvers above each engine. Now, this was destroyed in 1911. And here are two images that show before the fire and after the fire. Nothing, everything gone except those three bays. This is our field map of the turntable pit. It was constructed of large, massive granite blocks to form a circle. This is sort of a um, schematic view. so. In real life, it's circular, but to show three dimensions, it's um, somewhat adjusted. Within this ran a rail that formed a circle um, around the interior circumference, and that carried the mechanism which swung the trestle uh, to orient the direction that the locomotives entered the yard. Gravel fill in the bottom, inside the middle was a culvert, and that took water and drainage outside, across, under the tracks and outside the property. Here's one of the interior views. You can see those massive granite blocks. You can see the rail. You can see the slope, which directed water flow down into the gravel in the base of it that took it away for good drainage. This is the bridge. It's built on a um, steel girder. This is called a fish belly girder due to its shape, manufactured by um, the Boston Bridge Works in 1885. And of course, provided by the Boston and Main Railroad. Now, interestingly enough, this fish belly girder is a replacement. In the park restoration, which spruced up the turntable pit, the um, park also brought in a new girder, which they obtained from Keene. It's the same age, same date, and same manufacturing as the original. And the um, tracks were rebuilt on the surface. The center of the girder rests on a shoe, which pivots on a point in this block. And it rotates on this wheel system around the perimeter of the entire pit in order to direct the train traffic into the yard. Here we are north of the turntable pit looking south. And in this area, we recorded a series of walls and alignments of brick, granite and concrete on the ground surface. So you can see here sort of in the center, a brick alignment 
going down toward the turntable pit and other um, occurrences on the, on the right hand side of it. Here's that brick wall again. Here's a row of granite and concrete pads and the, the granite in, um, in the foreground forms a slight curve. So it radiates around an arc with the concrete and gravel areas behind it. These correspond with the, the granite blocks correspond with the front doors of the bays of the turntable, uh, sorry, the roundhouse. And the concrete and gravel correspond to the interior of the former roundhouse. With brick paving located around and about scattered in various places in the vicinity. So we found surface evidence for the general position of the original roundhouse building. And the ground penetrating radar defined several of the original seven work pits in subsurface setting, right where they should be, following surface evidence and looking at the difference in the imagery um, and the scale, we're able to confirm that there is still something underground related to these work pits. These work pits were located directly under the tracks and workers would go in, the pits were about 60 feet in length, they would go in and work above their heads on repairing the locomotives that were parked in the building. Other things of interest in that general vicinity involved the use of um, water systems. There were numerous sources of water in the immediate area. There was a water tower at the hotel outside to the west and another water tower associated with the store outside the tracks to the east. And there was a water tower in the yard which was immediately south of the turntable. And that picture of ivory rice, you could see it in the background. In 1923, all that was left was the three bay portion of the um, house. But there are some interesting things going on water-wise. In this picture, in this um, map, we see that there were hydrants we found the hydrants. We also found the water lines underground that crisscrossed the yard. And we found something very interesting in the engine house, which is called the Blake Fire Pump. Interesting, the fire pump went in in the 1920s, not predating the fire. This is what it looks like. Um, marked with a sewer manhole, which is kind of interesting because it's not a sewer. But this goes more feet than I'd care to uh, think about underground. The water pressure, the roar of water when that lid came off was phenomenal. And that would indeed have made a wonderful fire pump and was built exactly according to the specifications of a 1920s pump footing, according to the Blake Fire Pump Company. And there it is showing again that there are components still in place, still intact, and still providing a piece of the story of the rail yard. Moving out further to the north, we will get to the end. <laughs> Moving further north, we're going to go into the area of some of the shops, a machine shop, hugely important to make the equipment, um, repair things, fabricate whatever was needed, um, with an associated boiler house that where coal was burned to provide the energy to power the machinery and with other features um, adjacent to it, which I'll get to shortly. After the fire, that's what that area looked like. And today it looks like this. So 
Yes, standing on the active tracks, not a good idea. Um, standing on the active tracks, looking into the park, you can see the tracks that took you originally north to Conway and west to Wolfboro. You can see the basketball court that's part of the park and you can see leveled, graded and filled terrain, flat, flat, flat. And those tracks would have once run through a building. Here we go, the basketball court. The ground penetrating radar done in this basketball court and associated lawns came back with what um, Horizons and others called noise, which means that there was nothing clear cut. It was probably where all the fill and the debris was pushed and then leveled over after the fire. However, I'll call your attention to the tree line on the left hand side. Up in the trees, these other components were reported on the 1909 map, including a coal pocket, some sheds, and a pile driver building. Here's the pile driver. The pile driver was built in 1905 at this site uh, by the Boston and Maine. As the name suggests, it was taken along the line to drive piles into places that needed a bridge, a trestle, some sort of a crossing. And the pile was driven repeatedly using this machine to um, penetrate silts, clays, muds until it got to firm footing and then construction could occur on top. The track that the pile driver would have traveled on, one of those spur tracks up in the woods, has been removed, but the base of the track is still in place. This is the end of the track and you can see how it drops off. What you're looking at, that grayish area down below is that basketball court. That end of that uh, spur track is uh, created by these massive granite blocks and very substantial fill. We did not find the pile driver shed itself, but we found tantalizing clues broken um, corrugated roofing, window glass, other debris in the woods. But what I think is that this terminus with these large granite blocks is probably the location of the coal pocket. The coal pocket would have been a, a bin or a hopper and uh, the train would have backed cars containing coal up the spur track. They would have tilted and dumped the contents into the hopper, the coal would have then been extracted from it by little chutes or doors and used probably in the boiler room to fuel uh, the boilers necessary to operate the shops. So here's a beautiful example of um, construction. You can see the quarry marks giving us a nice 1800s quarry um, date. And this is only half of it. It extends that far again um, off to the right. Another surprise, this is an explosives safe. It's lined with metal and it's under that spur track. Um, it contained explosives, including dynamite, which was very important and would only be kept at a major yard, such as the San Bernville yard. The dynamite was used to detonate flares and those flares were the purpose of those flares was to warn train crews of obstructions along the track. So somebody went out with the flares, the dynamite, strapped it onto the track, set it off, and the report would be seen or heard up and down the track to avoid trains to not um, hit or fall into the obstruction uh, on the track. Not a job that I think I would have wanted. The second surprise up there in the woods was this area of enormous, massive granite blocks. They're a bit of a mystery. Um, however, knowing that this railroad connected to Conway and to the granite quarries also owned by the Boston and Maine gives us a hint that perhaps some of this granite or originated from the Conway quarries. 
Was it transported for future use? Was it pushed aside after the fire? We have no way of really knowing, but just look at that. It's amazing. And I consider this an archeological feature. Okay, getting out there now, further away are other integral parts of the yard, the paint shop, the carpenter shop, and a storage house. Also noting two culverts and a manhole. The paint shop and the carpenter shop were repair um, locations for keeping up with um, wear and tear on the cars. Paint would need retouching, um, interior wood in passenger cars would need replacing, and for building things that might be needed, especially for use in the storage house. Remember things were not being stored in cardboard or plastic, they were being stored in wooden boxes at this time. The storehouse would have had tools, supplies, you name it. Two pretty large buildings that looked like that. Also in this photo, I want to call your attention to the number of people here. This really highlights the importance of the yard in the economy of San Bernville. Uh, there was a 1903 roster of employees and 86 men were listed. That's not the whole total. There were people in the passenger depot, there were people in the restaurant working there. Pretty much every family in town had a job associated with this railroad. The fire devastated the town. And after the fire, the division headquarters were moved to Dover, not rebuilt. But back out in the woods, in the area of those workshops. What we see today are mounds of earth pushed and piled with tantalizing arrangements of brick that may or may not be architectural remains underground. Who knows? Unusual squared holes in the ground, um, possible foundations, waste pits, don't know, but there they are. This one is close to a very scary looking wetland, which was the um, excavated out for um, drainage from the paint shop. And here's the culvert, which was on that original um, 1909, uh, 1909 drawing. And you can see it here, fortunately covered over. And the trench, which leads away, carrying um, runoff and who knows what else out from the buildings. So there's enough clues to define the area as archeologically sensitive for the occurrence of those workshops, whether they be the paint shop, the storage building, or the carpenter shop. And adjacent, the woods are off on the left, adjacent to that are the tracks, the original tracks that were not removed. And you can see the ballast on the active track to the right. This brings us back up to the present day, which, you know, I'm really happy that we were able to sort of piece the story together on the history of the park. The park was restored because the community valued the place. Uh, Joseph Dodier, a um, selectman at the time, was instrumental in this. And the park today is a real wonderful place, very active and People come to take walks, they bring their kids to play. The Parks and Recreation Building is right next door. They have a little ice skating area in the winter, a little pavilion for plays and get togethers, music, and um, the Cotton Valley Rail Trail. The rail trail runs between San Bernville and Wolfboro. It's about 12 miles. It's beautiful. You get to walk through uplands and you get to walk through huge wetlands and beautiful areas that skirt the backlands north of Lake Wentworth. Those wetlands are, um, include locations associated with Ryefield and Ryefield was one of the Governor John Wentworth properties. So even that walk, if you look, you'll find not only wildlife and railroad, um, you know, remains, but you're also walking in a place that played into the um, 
the residence of colonial governor John Wentworth. Here's the trail heading south. The light area in the distance is the park itself. To conclude, we um, track down, if you will, information from so many sources, photos, maps. We use town nominations and area forms for um, background context, town histories, historic photos that I've shown you, maps from all kinds of sources, the Railroad Museum, the town, the Union Depot Museum. We relied on interviews with railroad historians, town historians, and the Heritage um, Commission. We completed survey and mapping on the ground surface, and we conducted ground penetrating radar, all successful. I'm confident that we can say that the archeological site has components within the entire two acre property known as Turntable Park. We obviously have the roundhouse components and the turntable, and we have other areas of um, granite and brick. We have features that are recognized on the ground surface that likely correspond with other activity areas in this once bustling and vibrant rail yard. I'm also confident to say that this archeological site contributes to the Sanbornville village history and historic area. And I believe it contributes to the knowledge of Wakefield as a whole and to the line between Dover and Conway. And in tribute, I offer this presentation and my work on this project to the people of Wakefield, past and present, including, I'll just give you a little tour from left to right, some of the um, important key personnel in the rail yard the people who worked in the Armstrong restaurant. And you know, when you really look at that picture, there's bowls of fruit, there's cakes in those glass um, pedestal cake. You can see the lanterns on the ceiling. They loved that, that place. It was important to the town. The fellow on the right holding the pail is a Civil War veteran who worked at the rail yard. Down below are some of the people that worked on the repairs. And people, a, a gentleman who is the brother of John Sanborn who worked in the station in one of the offices. So on that note, I simply say, thank you for joining me today, spending part of your Saturday with me in my office. Thank you for the opportunity to present this to you. Thank you, Vicki, and thank you to your uh, feline co-presenter. Uh, <laughs> we've got a number of questions here. And uh, the first one uh, is, what powered the turntable? What, what caused uh, that thing to turn with such a huge engine sitting on top? Men. They were pushed by hand? Mm -hmm. Wow. That, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and about those granite blocks off in the woods, is, do you have any idea, were they red? Were they identifiable as Conway granite? Or, you know, could you tell? Uh, yes and no. Some of them were that pinkish color that I, I couldn't say without having a chunk of redstone granite in one hand, holding it next to the rock. But visibly, many of them were pinkish in color, which leads me to speculate that they could have come from redstone. Others were gray. I, I really don't know, but. I, I think we lost you there. Um, uh, I, your flag man fascinates me. 
Um, mm-hmm. He had that, uh, that nice little house with that extensive garden. Uh, first question, was he essentially a, a human traffic light, uh, letting people know the train was coming by? I mean, was, was that his purpose in life? Uh, yes, that was his purpose. He didn't live there. He had a house in San Bernville. Um, descendants of his still live in town. And that was where he worked. He would go and his flag would tell you, better stop and wait for the train. Okay. And do you think there's anything left of the flagman's house? Is it possible? I doubt it. Um, The house did not burn in the fire. And the building itself, somebody told me, is used as a tool shed for one of the houses up on one of the lakes in Wakefield. I never tracked it down. So the building was lifted. The Mm -hmm. contents of the building belonged to Boston and Maine, and probably it was emptied out. Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing would not probably enter the subsurface record. And the Boston and Maine um, specifications for the building show that it was built on granite piers. The depth of those below grade is unknown, but that's really the only thing that would have gone into the ground anyway from construction of the building. So I don't know. Mm. I doubt that there's anything there given the fire, the restoration and the paved parking lot. Maybe it's acted as a cap over it, but I, I don't. Were there any um, railroad archaeological resources um, uh, present there that wouldn't be necessarily obvious to the regular person on the street? Was there something there uh, that you discovered or you would expect to discover that would say this is a railroad yard as opposed to a textile manufacturing place or a general uh, storage place? Uh, Was there a specific railroad signature to the the artifacts and, uh, that you might that you did or, or you might find there uh, that was set it apart from other industrial sites. Um, to to the f- I can only speak to the features. I can't speak to individual artifacts. We didn't really look for artifacts, so I don't know the answer to that question. But regarding the features, you know, we walked over those brick alignments for about a week before we said. Oh, wait a second. These look like the walls of where the um, roundhouse were. It, the project was very complicated because the remains were ephemeral and mysterious. Um, and it was by going back and forth between maps and plans and drawings and photographs that finally we had the aha moment. And we're able to say, oh yeah, the ash pit is here. That granite block is big enough to hold the tracks over an opening that would constitute the ash pit. So it was a sense of discovery that was very circular in nature. Mm. Uh, but I feel that we you know, found some of the key components of the site that way by going back again, 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 and again. I see. Um... Do you think there's anything in the ash pit or, I mean, it, it strikes me as being somewhat similar to a privy and that things go into it that are not necessarily intended. Do, do, you, do you think it's worth investigating if you had the chance? That's a good question. Um, except when the pit was in use, it was emptied out probably daily. Uh-huh. So what we might want to find instead is the ash pile. <laughs> Okay. Um, and shifting gears just a little bit, um, obviously you've enjoyed working on this uh, rail yard. Is there another category of sites that particularly interests you that uh, if you were given a, uh, a pot of money to go out and, and investigate a certain kind of site, uh, top on your list would be what? Well, I mean, I, I am a prehistorian, if that Can we still say that? Um, And so Native American pre-contact sites are still, you know, what I love. But while we're talking about post-contact sites, just give me a mill, give me a water-powered mill any day 
and I couldn't be happier. Uh, can you talk to us about some of the water power mills that you have worked on? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Wakefield, for example, we recorded and uh, mapped, photoed, researched, did the whole thing at about 20 mills. Um, I recently did a study in Moultonboro for a mill complex at Moultonboro Falls, which has roots to the first settlement in the 1780s. I did a survey of mills of similar age on the Lamprey River uh, for General John Sullivan's early industry. It included um, a grist mill, a sawmill, and a fulling mill. Uh, those are some of my favorites, um, but I haven't met one that doesn't become a favorite uh, ultimately. Okay, uh, a question that just came in, uh, you could elaborate on what happened to the rail yard area after the fire. Uh, can you distinguish uh, post-fire uh, uh, activity and structures from pre-fire ones? I mean, uh, it seems that it was reduced in size, but it was still there. So can you, can you elaborate a little bit on the, the post-fire nature of the, of the property? Well, I don't know that we, we saw post-fire nature of the property because we didn't really do any testing in the ground. So I cannot speak to things like ash layers or trash layers. The photos show complete, utter devastation. And I don't know if the material was carted off-site or pushed around and buried on-site. I really don't have any information on that. Nothing was found. Um, it's a good question, and it would be nice to know. But from those images, I think you get a sense of everything went. All those shops didn't exist. It's not like there were timbers on the ground. There was nothing. Um, if it wasn't metal, it wasn't there. I'm not sure if that was an answer. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. So um, if you could go back for another uh, round of investigation and you had a free hand, what, what would you do? Would you be excavating more GPR, combination of techniques? Um, if you had another uh, bite of the apple, what would that look like? Probably a combination. Um, try to see what's going on in more detail up in the woods, away from things. Um, but I think we've got the chronology pretty well established. And if we were to try to define the subsurface things in greater detail, it might involve some testing or excavation. Um, but no one spot actually is calling to me mm -hmm. in particular. Well, I think that pretty well wraps it up. I really appreciate your, your taking the time to give us this presentation. Uh, it's certainly been sitting on the, on the back burner uh, bubbling away here for a few years. Uh, and we do appreciate that uh, you've gone to all this effort to uh, bring it forward for us. And I want to congratulate you again on the Chester Price Award. You, you certainly deserve it. And with that, we'll say um, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.